It's something that I do want to do. You know, when you want to self-improve, no one's telling you to do it, but just observationally, I would like it if I got to the point quicker. And so it's just something I want to improve for myself, not for anyone else. I know it's got to do with talking to other people, but for me, uh, it, it's me improving an aspect of myself in relation to the world, like being able to dance better with something externally to me, being able to clearly communicate exactly what I think to someone, not add five minutes of filler, not not say it five different ways to to get get it clear, but actually just say it one way. I, I want to get better at being more concise. Hey, but at the same time, you can be very concise and then you risk being misunderstood if you re-express it five times from, from different perspectives and with different language. It helps with the clarity of the situation. It, it depends how you interpret it at the end of the day. Because sure, well, like sure, I, I I know, I think that if I just naturally am aware of not going on autopilot and meandering around, but being paying attention to what I'm saying more and more, I think I will naturally become more concise. I'm not, I'm more concise. I don't think I'm. I'm not going to kick myself. But I'm just going to pay attention to it and see if I can sharpen it over time, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. And, and since you mentioned self-improvement, a, a lot of the times it's a pipe dream. People like to see self-improvement as a, as a catch-all for, for a bunch of things that they do in their lives. They've like, they like to uh, relabel the things that we used to call either passions or hobbies or everything else. Now they like to view it as self-improvement. It, it's no longer reading a book. It's uh, I, I'm self-improving because I'm reading about something that's related to my job or, or whatever else. And uh, I, I've noticed a lot of individuals um, really going against their nature when it comes to self-improving, doing things that they're genuinely not comfortable with or trying to be people that they're not. And a lot of the times, if life works for you and you're in a good place, there is not a lot of reason to uh, enact changes within your within your life just because you're you're trying to get on this self improvement boat. Of course, there are some things that you would appreciate um, getting better over time, but there's a bit of a, a cost effectiveness that you do with every decision in your life. And sometimes it's just not worth it. Or or as the Manosphere likes to say, you know, the juice is not worth the squeeze. Like, well, what what amount of effort are you going to put in and how much are you really going to get out? I I watched a video a couple of days ago when it was rehashing all of the all, all of the quintessential Manosphere memes of, oh, go to the gym, start a business, do this, do that. And uh I came across a couple of uh, of pictures from the black pillosphere of, of YouTube with guys that were ripped and they had absolutely horrible faces. Like <laughs> it didn't matter how much you went to the gym. The faces was the the major issue that these guys had. You you could have looked like Arnold Schwarzenegger in his prime, but your uh your other features wouldn't have helped you in any way, shape, or form. So that guy can cope as much as he wants with the gym. There's no amount of of business acumen or of working out that, that was going to help him uh, attract other people, at least, at least when it comes to face value. I mean, if you just go out. So it, it really depends on uh, on the honesty that you have with yourself. And sometimes guys just don't even tell you what the problem is with you. Well, sometimes they might be embarrassed because they know they can't do anything, say, for instance, uh, like you mentioned about their face. They can't really do anything about that. And and that's fine. But I, I just think it's a matter of doing the best with what you've got. And for me, something like improving uh, my conciseness with uh, communicating a point, I think it, I'm interested in it for myself. Just as an objective person being able to communicate well. When I see people in videos and, and people who are doing something that I can't do quite as well, and I have an actual interest and admiration about it, I think it's kind of noble or whatever. 
and <clears throat> I have a natural self-interest in it. Like, for instance, uh, when I latched onto drawing when I was young, no one told me I should. It just sparked some natural connection with me, and I kept doing it, and I wanted to get better, and I saw people that were better than me, and you just want to refine that thing. And I agree, if it's not working for you, don't. For instance, yeah, th there are some people that keep plugging away at a career that's not for them, and they break, or for instance... Uh, we we're talking uh, previously with Peg about singing. I it's it'd be nice if I could sing well, but I don't care enough. And what am I going to get out of it? I I I respect it, but it's not really anything that I, in and of itself, love and and uh, and want to get good at and want to get and want to dive into. If that makes sense. So it's a matter of kind of yes, there could be a utility for it. But you could be also distracting yourself. I, I, you know, a couple of guys that you and I even know, they could be learning five languages. But f sometimes for me, it's just a distraction to actually not address the other things that could make your life inf infinitely better. But no, I'm going to learn five useless languages that I'll never, never use other than to say a few phrases online and keep plugging away at that until the grave. And, and that for me is more I, I'm not addressing things I'm distracting myself with uh, you know a, a fake method of showing people that I'm improving in some way but you're not actually improving in a way that you can make use of that where it can uh, make your life better if that makes sense oh it definitely does and I think that's a very important point um let me let me phrase this in uh, in the form of a question. Uh, this year you had you had a couple of uh, well not not just this year but the past couple of years you had a couple of changes in your life mm -hmm. that kind of impacted the way that you live. And he here's the the important question that I or, or at least what I would view to be an important question in regards to that. How how many of the things that you've changed in your life? were the result of natural evolution and comfort and how many of them was because you actively tried to self-improve because to, to me it seems that for the majority of things that you actually need and and the things that do bring you peace even if it's a if it's just day-to-day -day living in a work environment and so on and so forth a natural type of evolution is what's going to mold better to people's lives in general rather than trying to chase the dream of what some internet guru says or trying to chase something just because societally it's viewed as doing the right thing or doing the good thing or doing what's healthy for you um can you phrase it uh uh in a sentence because uh, i'm not before I answer you, I want to kind of know exactly what you're what you're referring to, what you mean. See, that's a perfect example where it would, where it would be better if I rambled on and expressed the question in three different ways, you, <laughs> which is exactly what you do. <laughs> which out of the two, between self improvement and just a way of naturally adapting to something? do you think would bring you more comfort or what has, uh, or what brought you more comfort between those two during the past two years where you've had the changes going on in your life? Well, that's interesting because they're interrelated. The more I self improve in terms of being honest. So we've talked about this where whatever it is, uh, your past heartbreak, where you live, uh, how you were brought up, your relationship with your parents and what they did or didn't give you. The more you get to the heart of what your ball and chain is and where you're hamstrung and, and where you have difficulties, that can actually get you to really know what genuine self-improvement, what what will not just you know improve you relating to people in the world, but improve you relating to people in the world as the genuine you that hangs out with your friends, the the genuine you that doesn't need to put on a show to impress people or women or anything. So I think it's kind of a dance. So it, it becomes more natural when you know yourself more. Am I describing the 
where I'm coming from with the answer, or is it still kind of not answering your question? Oh, I, I'm seeing. I'm definitely seeing the perspective where you're coming from. However, the difference that I would make between the two is, um, let, let me think of, of a of a more poignant example is you doing something because it brings you pleasure and you forcing yourself to do something because uh it, it's just the right thing to do for for example if um if somebody moves in with you and you naturally communicate with them more and you slowly grow into the idea that you mentioned earlier of being more honest of working on your communication skills it's something that kind of naturally comes to you. And even if you put effort into it, it automatically brings you pleasure. And yeah, that, that's a good thing. It's something that you're actively putting effort into, but it's not something that's drooling for you. Like something that, for example, well, I'm going to go to the gym just because it's good to go to the gym. I'm, I'm forcing myself, I'm putting myself through this pain just to be able to say that I'm self-improving. Though those two actions are completely different. Yeah, yeah, they may have similar amounts of effort put into them, but one of them is going to give you more returns when it comes to the actual satisfaction that you get out of one, while the other is just going to feel like self-torture. Yeah, that comes from, I, I, I was just thinking, that comes from actually having your antenna up more than you used to because i think most of us go through life with our antenna down and doing the safe habits and calling that us like no that's just me i'm the kind of person that doesn't go out i'm the kind of person that doesn't talk to girls i i'm the kind of person that likes this menial job and that's what i know and i think whether you get there naturally or you're sick of where you are there's something that happens where you start paying attention to when a, uh, the, the same choice, the same crossroad comes into your life. You don't automatically just always choose left all the time because you've always chosen left. What happens is sometimes you get to the crossroads and it's like, I feel like I'm, I feel this sinking feeling that I am leaning towards left again, and I'm just going to be back here again. You, and for what you're referring to, uh, how I, I met Stephanie and I, I moved in with her, that was one of those moments that in my life for the last few years, I'm trying to, when I come to a familiar feeling, not being neurotic, but am I, am I just being comfortable? Am I just being familiar? Or am I going to be uh, is there a possibility of being happier and 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 getting actually what i want afterwards and and having a bit of adventure and and having a smile on my face or is this just me going back in my hole and going back to bed and feeling comfort you know it's so it's kind of like a, a self-awareness thing so you know your old habits i think just as you get older keep you safe and you just keep doing the safe thing. Is that answering your question? Since you brought up that example, I think it's uh, I think it'll perfectly illuminate what we're what what my question is because when you're at that crossroads that you've mentioned earlier, now mm -hmm. because of the changes that you've had in your life, assuming that you didn't have Stephanie, do you think that choice would have been grueling before? And how comfortable would it be now if you were to compare the two? What do you mean? If I think back to who I was, um, yes. If you were at the same crossroads with or without Stephanie, having have having the same choice put in front of you, which one brings you more comfort when it when it comes to going right, rather than rather than going back to your comfort zone? Well, it also it's contextual. It, it comes down to also you recognizing that there is an actual uh, right turn to be made, and it. It, it, it is a, say, a calculated, unfamiliar risk or unknown yeah. path, you know? Yeah, but that's what I mean by evolution. Like, you've gotten to the point where now you can't, not only do you recognize that you have a right path, you can see that, well, maybe it's not as bad as I thought it was going to be. Or it may bring me more comfort. Or, yeah, it may be a bit uncomfortable, 
but it's enough discomfort that I'm willing to bear it for the potential rewards. Yeah, but I, I do want to come back to the very important point. It's not just you you come to the crossroads and you've always turned left. And so now you just choose to hang on. Let me just choose the other path. Like, let me just see what happens. And I think that's not necessarily smart. And that's what a lot of the manosphere says. It's like, well, if you know the left path and that's sensible and that's you, why would you just choose the opposite just to be um, combative or like contrarian, right? The important thing is when you actually start to be honest with yourself and choose the thing you should do, when you come to the crossroads, the comfort zone doesn't pull you as much and you stubbornly want to try what's right and choose what's right. And that's only in the context of, say, Stephanie. If she was another bimbo, I would still cho choose left. So it's still contextual on yeah, what yeah. the what the left path is. So it's not just, okay, I, I, I say, well, next time I come to the crossroads, I'm going right just to see what happens because I want to have courage and try right. No, next time I'm going to think about it contextually, if the right path you know, is the one I should take, I'm not going to cowardly or comfortably pick the left because it's what I know and the rules are better and the stats uh, give me more security going left. No, I am going to trust my own judgment and my own empirical experience and have a, a bit of calculated risk and courage to, to choose the thing that's been given to me that ostensibly I should be picking instead of the comfort zone, but I won't because it's not comfortable and it, there's a little bit of a risk and I need to kind of be a bit more courageous. So it is contextual. It's not just a matter of choosing right because I told myself I was going to do it. It's more, how am I going to operate when I do have the crossroad in front of me? Well, of course, because the, the variables are different. How, however, the, the point that I was trying to get at was that within the right context, going right doesn't seem so abysmal as it used to before. Yes, and, 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 and it's also exciting for the first yes. time. You decide... Uh, you decide that way, and then that kind of jumping out of a, pl a plane with a parachute is, is kind of exhilarating, and, and and it feels like you're 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 sort of like living life and and making a decision. You're not sleepwalking, so uh, it is a choice. Yeah, precisely. Yeah, I exactly. Because when the variables change, everything in your life changes. And as much as I like to to bash the idea of, oh, go to the gym, start a business and so on and so forth, you are a different person after you do those things. You're no longer the guy that's locked back at home. You're now the guy that has a business. You're you're no you're no longer making minimum wage at McDonald's. You have 40 clients and now you're making, I don't know, however much you're making a week or a month. You're no longer the fat guy that was sitting on the chair. You're the guy that's now fit. However, I think a lot of the time when you hear these types of stories of, oh, I got my life together and so on and so forth, a lot of these individuals would want to see recognition for the effort that they put in without acknowledging the fact that the newer people that are coming into their lives, A, never saw that transformation and B, would never be able to accurately give you the recognition that you're looking for. As far as they know, you're, you're the billionaire fit guy or the millionaire fit guy that they just met five minutes ago. And you can have all of this pain on top of your shoulders that nobody will give you will ever give you any recognition for as much as you you would want to show it out and, and for other people to see all the all the struggle that you went through and be appreciated for. Yeah, sure. I mean, I guess uh, the people want to be seen for the totality of who they are. Like they meet someone and, oh, this person gets me. They understand me. But they just met you. They don't know that you've been training for this long or you've worked a certain job or uh, amassed a certain lifestyle and you're proud of the work you've done to get to where you are. They don't know you yet. Um, is that what you're saying? Yeah, but I kind of disagree that they want they want to be seen for the totality of what they are, because like like with everyone, they don't want their faults being brought to the forefront. 
they just want to see that oh you're the guy that put in six days in the gym the every week for the past eight years and that shows that you have uh competence and dedication but they also don't want to recognize that with that amount of effort well you're also the guy that didn't take care of his dog properly because of the amount of time that you spend at the gym or because of the demanding job that you have you're the guy that can't really be a homebody and you you can't you need a you need a partner that's also going to be okay with you being gone for almost the entire day it, it's a constant balancing act between your your faults what you can offer and uh, and your qualities and that's something that's never discussed yeah it's also the perspective you take uh, as well i remember because it's i think it's a kind of male thing and and, and it is very practical it's very useful to kind of look at the world in a very ontological way, things are the way they are. You you know the, the sun goes up, it goes down, gravity, all those things. And so th there's this really strong inclination to look at those kind of patterns within p between relationships, men and women, and who you choose and whatever. And I think that the the, the manosphere and guys and the dating coaches and stuff they they try and preempt and predict these things to give you a a one two three step process to it like guarantee almost you'll get success as though w when we talk about that crossroad i was like most people who want to you know responsibly improve their next decision of say a, a girlfriend you will say okay next time i come to the crossroad i'm going to make sure i walk up to a certain type of crossroad and i'm always going to take the the right the path that leads right and i'm never going to take left and everything i prepare will give me the exact kind of crossroad i want and i'll always take the right turn as though it's kind of like a train track that you pull the lever 10 miles down the track and it's corrected itself up ahead so you will always go right but the reality is you're walking along a path and you just come up to a fork in the road and you have to make a decision in real time and you can only make it well by you know uh, recalling your experience trusting yourself knowing what to discard and knowing what subjectively matters to you now uh, it's it's very much real time and experience and knowledge can help you but it's kind of a it's like a, a an athlete all the training comes down to this moment and being able to kind of move and instinctually kind of um, use all of that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And and at the bottom of it, there's also the assumption that you will always be able to go left. In a sense, it's a, it's a sort of a promise that you'll always be static, that whatever happens in your life and whatever happens outside of you, you will have the option of going left. And that left- Well, that's, that's very important. There. Well, that's very important. Like all of these prescriptive scientific based stuff is looking for, you know, a way to always go right. But this way of thinking is like, no, no, when I come to this crossroads, I have every rational, comfortable option to go left again, unless the option right is the right choice. And I will decide. Whereas they try to via consensus, you know, with all the uh, high value stuff and putting all the ducks in a row, like Nostradamus predict this perfect equation that you can always go right. You can always go to the gym, get jacked, make money, and you can always get your perfect woman and you'll only have right turns. But the point is, if you want to make right turns, you you have to approach forks in the road where the left option is the best one that will allow you to keep going to find other right turns. So it's it's a very different way. The other way is being a lemming that's trying to create perfect maps that will on autopilot keep leading you to take perfect right turns. But my way of thinking is just kind of know when you get to a crossroads, when a right turn is a right turn, and when you quite rightly just stay in your comfort zone and keep going left until you come to an, an, another fork in the road where the right turn seems like the best option where the the right term might take more courage but it's better than the continuing along the gray autopilot left yeah yeah and and it's not just that it's um when you look at it for from a certain perspective it's it's whole it, 
on on the entirety of it is just a huge cope. Each time you hear the the excuses or at least the very generalized solutions that a lot of the a lot of the content creators that are offering that they're just copes e- even when they try to to give advice to other people if you can sum it up with the three memes of that, that we've talked about before so much it, it really becomes a uh, a situation where you realize that all of these individuals are just coping and very few of them are actually uh, out of the pattern far enough to where they can have a bit of survivorship bias and, and try to flex that in front of you as though you're going to reach the same amount of success if you just follow these three steps. Mm. And if you genuinely have a look at them, you're going to realize that they're just valueless men commenting on valued women. And they're just looking at them going, eh, you're going to feel bad when you're over 30. You're going to regret not having me. It's like, dude, come on, stop, stop the cope. Like she, she's going to be more valued, even on the basis of biology, which you like to quote 99% of the time, just on at a starting level, she's more valuable than you. And she's going to keep being more valuable than you. And you have things like OnlyFans and all, all of these other platforms that prove that even after you think that they've hit the wall, they're still more valuable than you. Like, stop it with the cope and stop with this estrogen-filled way of thinking. Like, you, you remind me more of women than women do. Yeah, it's that fantasy of uh, karma or you'll be sorry later or, you know, God will get you in the afterlife if you don't, you know, it's, it's this kind of like up ahead, you'll be sorry. And uh, the reality is with women, they, they, they're going to have a softer landing than men. Uh, even porn stars get married, no, no matter what they've done, they could have done the most atrocious stuff and uh, they'll always find a soft landing. You know, they might not get, uh, they might not get the guy that they threw away when they were 25, but they will get someone fairly stable, probably rich, financial security. And let's be honest, if they were just partying and having fun in their 20s, they've had that time and they probably know they can't have that time in the way they had it when they had a 25-year-old body and all that energy and their youth and beauty and power. And they just know at 40 or 50, they're not that person, but they can still get security and uh, feel safe and a lot of other really important qualities that women find important. They, they, they are going to land on their feet. They, they are cats. They have nine lives. But men, they're not. They're dogs. And I, I think this whole, well, you'll be sorry later it is kind of like, well, you'll go to hell later if you don't do what you know, you're supposed to do. I think it's just kind of an empty threat. And it makes them feel better, like you said. It helps them cope. But what could what could kind of help you is just not caring about some fictional romantic mu- movie outcome in the future where the chick that broke your heart now or treated you like shit later on you're going to be satisfied when she um she gets her due. I, I mean, even I even thought sometimes just as a, and I think most guys have when when they're younger. A girl breaks your heart and, you know, you, you feel your heart broken, destroyed. And then a couple of years later, you might think about it and you think, yeah, I'm, I'm getting my life together. I hope I bump into her now so she can see how much I'm over her. <laughs> like, tell me if it's yeah. not true. Most it guys is, do that. I, I, don't, I don't think that there's a guy out there that hasn't thought that yet. <laughs> yeah, and me as well. It's like, yeah, I, I don't care about her. I never want to get back with her. But I want her to see me now. It's, and that is what you need to. You want to get better that you your self-esteem is like objectively, yeah, you're better. You don't need her. Let her see you like the old you and be proud of you. But you're not necessarily doing it for them. But then you catch yourself and say, really, am I doing it for somebody I don't care about and I'll never get back to back with again? So it's there's some truth to the the manosphere saying, uh, you know, be the best version you can be and chase, I don't know, excellence, whatever the cliche is, right? And women will come. But they always add in the women will come. And what most horny guys hear is, well, that's really what I want, women and so if I pretend to chase something, instead of admitting what I'm chasing, 
I'll I'll get them. So if I chase a business or if I chase the perfect body, I will get women. But women is really the thing I'm chasing. What you have to honestly chase what you're chasing, and then the consequence of that. Yeah, you get the rewards, but you can't lie to yourself about what you're chasing. And I think a lot of guys do, me included in the past. But And it's only when you start chasing, we talked about whether it's learning a language, is it a distraction or are you avoiding what you're actually chasing? Are you being indirect? Uh, those are imp important questions. Well, I, I do want to touch upon the saying that you mentioned. I, I do agree that the women will come they they just won't come with you they'll come with the guys that they're actually attracted to so you you can just keep going and, and doing whatever you're doing and for certain i guarantee that all of the women around you will come whether if it's with a piece of plastic or or with the individual that you find so detestable that's around you but they will they, they just won't with you <laughs> you'll you'll just be stuck watching uh certain types of content on YouTube for, for the rest of your life until you actually decide well, to do something. Here's the important point, right? Say for the guy who was hurt by an ex he he loved, right? And like I said, we've been there, you you get over it after a year or so, you think back, you've 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 healed, your scars have dried up, but it's there's still a scar there and you just think, well, if she saw me now, I it would be um closure. You know, I'd feel great and then I can fully let her go. But what people want in that kind of karma revenge is like the the ex coming back and saying, Oh, I was sorry. You were you were right. I was wrong. I should never have broken up with you. I should never have treated you well. And even if you get that, say you get that vindication, yes, I'm I'm a millionaire now. Now you're sorry. Now you want me back. You still would not take her back. So why are you directing your life to get revenge on your ex or the type of women that always rejected you why do you want to direct all your energies to get a, another version in the future so you can be in control when you don't even respect them and you can't trust that kind of person and they're exactly the kind of woman that broke your heart before what you want to do is direct yourself that you honestly even if the past kind of girlfriend or girls come back you will be proud like, yeah, now you want me, but you don't pick them. And and that's the honesty. Like you do want to be better. So and even if those exes and the bimbos that broke your heart now come back and want you, you don't want them because you see them for what they are. But you, you mentioned it yourself. It's not about that. It's about the revenge. It's about the revenge yeah. and, and the vindication, because ultimately what they're chasing is what other individuals complement and value, not not the things that they're um, that would be genuinely good for their lives. They're not investing in themselves. They're investing in the idea of other people complimenting them and looking at them like they're some source of inspiration. Yep. Well, look, as this is one thing I discovered that made my life simpler and clearer like what you know the manosphere is great and i met a lot of bunch of bunch of people through my channel including yourself over the years had great conversations but i noticed that as i wanted to keep improving in ways that made sense for me and improve my own life i felt myself drifting away from the group think like from the rules and the way the equations that they gave for me to implement that didn't work that basically would give me the answers, but they're not answers. That they really aren't answers if I can't implement them in my life and they don't make my subjective life better. And so when they give you the stats of, you know, um, half of marriages end or eighty percent of women are the ones that initiate breakups or divorces or whatever it might be, it's interesting. But I started to feel like, well, what if I intentionally date a certain way? What if I don't? Um, when I go on a date, what if I, despite what the dating coaches and experts say, you know, avoid a marriage, avoid religious conversations, re avoid conversations about exes, what if I don't? What if it's important that I find out exactly who they are by not avoiding those, because the stats say 
don't talk about those things because you never get in, into bed and this is the only formula that works. But that formula never works for me. So what if I do things differently and they're saying, well, then it doesn't work. And I found myself drifting away from that kind of religious consensus formulaic speak. And I think that's that's what kind of worked for me. And and I, I noticed with even the guys that I respected in, in the Manosphere who had very intellectual um, they weren't philosophical conversations. They were very technical conversations about dating. I started to realize it's like you can't have a a scientific and technical dry conversation about something that you want to feel something through. It's it's kind of like talking about color, but only being in black and white. And I started to realize that no, no, no. My my empirical experience is the most important thing in here. What I what I decide to do and how I decide to date or think and speak finally and not censor myself because I won't get the girl that way, but not give a shit and 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 ask the questions I should ask that other guys are afraid to ask on a date because they're afraid of the woman and there's no reason to be afraid of her. And, and once I started questioning those and, and, and I saw the pushback of the manosphere, I started to say, well, well, if you don't, if you won't let me even test this experiment, then I'd rather not talk to you about it. Like, if my life has to be by consensus to whatever you guys think, and we're all sitting in the same circle jerk, and life's never working for us, yet you're like crabs in a bucket, and you won't allow me to leave, just to kind of, if I fail, I fail, but you won't let me leave. It's kind of like there's something wrong here. Why, why can't I screw up? Why can't I get in the boxing ring and get take a punch or two to know what it's like interacting with women, to kind of know if this works or if it doesn't? Like all this theory started to kind of annoy me. I know I'm going off on a bit of a tangent. No, but, no, you're um, not. You're not at all. But um, yeah, I, I started to realize with, with especially the guys I was having conversations with and we we felt like, you know, friends and we we're discussing these ideas. I started to realize the moment I started to get very subjective and philosophical, they started to distance themselves from me. And I noticed that the philosophical, the introspective, the very, very personal meaning of how I wanted to conduct myself, who I was, um, uh, what I subjectively want. I don't, I don't care about the stats. I don't care about men and women, what I ac actually want. Then they started to look at me like I was woo woo or, or weird. And I didn't belong in their formula. But I started to realize that my life with women in life in general, my routines, I slept better. Things were working more when I started to realize that almost nothing is true. All these guys are looking for the capital T truth in the ontological science-based thing. And I just learned that like, you know what? Almost nothing is true if I bend things enough in, in my intent. The easiest way to describe what you've said is to draw a parallel with medication. Um, a, a lot of the times there are different active ingredients within medication for, for the same type of illness, specifically because you can be uh, either allergic, resistant, or a certain type of substance can create various side effects within your body. Mm. And... Uh, because of that, you have different active substances and different pills. If, if you don't respond well to a certain type of treatment, they're, they're going to give you something else. And ideology does, does the same thing. If you're taking the wrong pill, you're essentially poisoning yourself. It doesn't matter if scientifically this thing is going to cure you. It's doing damage in other ways to, to the person that you are. And while yep. you do need to be uh acutely aware of all of the stats and everything else that's going on you still need to temper all of that with the type of person that you are with your level of rationality with the things that you're comfortable with with uh with your level of attractiveness wealth and, and everything else that you have going on in your life with the things that you're willing to lose the things that you're willing to risk and so on and so forth because if you just take a very general solution to everything that's going on in your life, you will just be narrowing everything that you can do. It, it's mm. ultimately poison for the mind and for the soul. 
Yep. 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 And, and and like everyone can recognize, you look at anyone, not necessarily that's exceptional, right? We can look at the Picassos and Elon Musks and whoever, right? It's not about being exceptional in the eyes of others so everyone can kind of kiss your feet, right? It's the people that kind of just grab hold of stubbornly doing what they believe in. So I don't know, some people might know people that aren't famous but they're very happy doing what they love doing because they know what they love doing is what they love doing and no one told them to do it. In my case, I always knew that the creative artistic drawing stuff, all the stuff I enjoy doing like these videos and gadgets and stuff, you've got your own stuff. That stuff, those people should be the the example, the equation of what to follow. Not exactly, but in that way. So there's not one formula, like you said, you can't give everyone give everyone the same medication and everyone is healthy. You some pers person can take one medication and completely balances and balances them out. Another person takes the same medication that should make them better and it makes them demonstrably worse. So this is the kind of thing that the one size fits all medication that the 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 red pill sphere and the manosphere wants uh it, it can be instructional but when it becomes prescriptive and this is the funny thing the manosphere tries to say oh no we're just describing science we're not being prescriptive we're just describing it's like no uh it's becoming very prescriptive because there's only certain ways to to get success with women and stuff and it's very formulaic so you're bullshitting well well none of these guys have a manual do they like they just can't put one thing in front in front of your face and say all you need to do is read this and you'll be good for the rest of your life. None of them do. It, it, it's the, it doesn't matter if we're talking about biology. It doesn't matter if we're talking about social skills. It doesn't matter what what the subject is. Nobody has anything fully figured out. And and if you if you think about it, uh, some of the older uh, OGs of the of the manosphere. They, they constantly talked about growth, about experiences, and I, I forgot who, who the quote belongs to, but um, somebody said growth only happens when you're listening to those most different from yourself. Mm. And there's and there's a lot of truth to that to that statement. Now, granted, there are things that are so far removed from myself and, and ideologies that I viscerally disagree with, even if I hear uh, a couple of sentences uttered by somebody that's on the complete opposite side of the spectrum. However, that doesn't mean that if I move a bit closer to myself, I can't find somebody with which I can have a discussion and maybe even get some value uh, f from the ideas that they're expressing. You, I may even find things that are not just compatible to me, things that would improve my situation just because I was willing to listen. And mm. it, it's extremely important to just have the ability to listen in the first place. You don't need to be offended at every bad idea that you hear uttered on the Internet. I'll give you an example with last um, with, with the Christmas dinner that I went to. Uh, one of the uh, one of the people that was there uh, was present with their mother and uh, and their grandmother. And this particular individual was the type of person that, irrespective of the conversation, he is the type of guy that needs to be right. And he will fight <laughs> you tooth and nail for anything, and he'll speak over you, and it doesn't matter what you say. He will fight you to the death if he has to. And he, he was having these types of conversations. Uh, he was having a conversation with his mother. And from my point of view... Even though he wasn't cursing her out, he wasn't uh, he, he wasn't being openly um, uh, insulting. I would never talk to any member of my family, particularly my mother, in that way. Like if I did, I'd have the same experience that you probably would. You'd get smacked across the head instantly. Like you do not talk to your mother that way. You're not that combative to your mother. Now, granted, of course, there's a lot of leeway there, and if you're right, and so on and so forth. But you're in a public setting; you have people around you that you don't know. 
uh, that they're not that close to you and so on and so forth. It's not a good situation uh, for you to be that combative and, and trying to win a point, especially on a subject that ultimately is pointless because they were talking about economics or some bullshit. Like, it, it doesn't matter. Yet You're making yourself be the asshole in the room. And I think a lot of that is um, is the same type of behavior that the that the manosphere tries to laud, and it's well, it's way more complicated than that. Because at the same time, these same people that were having the fight, they were looking at other individuals in the room, and that kids that were perhaps not as intelligent as this other guy, not as good looking, not as well dressed. Yet he was the one that ultimately got shunned and people didn't want to have around. Yes, he was right, but you're getting ostracized because of it and the way that you're comporting yourself. And somebody that's uh, way less argumentative, perhaps not as uh, not as well prepared, they're going to get the upper hand. Well, everyone, I think, can not everyone. Uh, let me say that again. I think most people who... Um, are fair and not so egotistical can feel when someone's confident and um, ha has a hold on themselves compared to someone who's always trying to be right and win every argument like the individual you're describing. Someone who's quietly confident, believes in what they say, but you know, you might say they're arrogant, but really if they're open to different suggestions or they let certain things go, this is one thing as well. I, the, the thing about being in, interested in a lot of intellectual stuff, especially, say, the Manosphere, it does inform you so much. It's really, really useful. But if you don't use it through who you are and your own brain and thinking, if you always put put the Manosphere in front of you as a representative for you on dates and in discussions and arguments with people, you come off looking weird a, no one sees who you are because it's not you. You're just like a megaphone for the, you know, the, the, the manosphere or whatever group or you could be religious speaks for you. And again, you're not present. You've got a safe Bible in front of you defending you and making you right and, you know, pulling the sword out and, and, and fighting people off. But the quietly confident people, like I'm pretty sure that the guys in Manosphere, whoever they look up to, it could be Richard Cooper, Andrew Tate, um, whatever these guys are that have made themselves into their own version of however confident they are, right? Rather than saying, I am going to, that's admirable, and I want to be my own version in that direction, whatever it might be. It's not, But it's not grabbing Andrew Tate and placing him in front of every girl I go on a date with and pantomiming everything Andrew Tate says. The lesson is you look at what you admire and the people you admire and you start to cherry pick how they think, what they say, and you you come up with your own ethics and values leaning in that direction. You 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 start to speak your own words, but I think everyone just puts the representative in front of them and, and allows that to try and speak for them on dates and in situations, and you end up looking like a dickhead. Uh, well, there's another thing to be said in regards to that, because when you look at the at, at, at the plethora of, um, um, let's say, models that you can find, people that you can model your life after, it's astounding to me that a lot of the times the individuals that consume the content – make the assumption that the people that they're watching are normal because mm. the, their definition of normal. And here I'm talking about the content creators are people that are similar to them. And a lot of the times, if, if you know a bit about these individuals, and I'm not strictly talking about the manosphere here, I'm talking about content creators in general. A lot of them have a, a, a plethora of issues from mm. health issues to mental issues to depression, to anxiety, uh, take even the recent debacles that are happening with uh, people that were in open relationships failing <laughs> and, and, and having multiple breakdowns and, and so on and so forth. And and you look at it and it's like, mate, th this is not, first of all, it's not what you, you're going to find in quote unquote real life. It's not something that you're going to walk down the street and you're going to encounter 
uh, 25 out of 30 people that are in open relationships and so on and so forth. Two, you have guys that have have been through the ring and now they're they're so scared of everything that they uh, assume that avoidance is the is the solution to everything. You have individuals that can perform bad in a video game on camera because they have anxiety attacks. And and these are the people that you're looking for, uh, that you're looking to for solutions. Like, I, I'm sorry, but you don't really have good role models. It, 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 these are the the people that you're looking at to to guide you in life. And most of them aren't. Um, oh, how do I phrase this? Because I'm oh, that's fine. I'll just say it the way I'm thinking. Uh, they're not successful in the traditional sense. And there is something to be said about being successful traditionally, because what uh, what a lot of the Manosphere content are is just the it's just a different flavor of an OnlyFans girl. They're successful because of the views they get on YouTube and the donations that they get on Patreon. They just don't happen to show their breast on camera most of the times. Because it, it's kind of the same, uh, it, it's kind of the same dynamic, except that they're pretending that they're offering value to their to their viewers. But ultimately, it's the same. Uh, it's the same dynamic. You're receiving donations because of uh, some perceived value that you're offering other guys. Yeah. But it's not. Uh, um. It, it's not a a way through which you show everybody else that you're competent. It's in no way, shape, or form a a demonstration of competence, of intelligence, of of anything else. Like a lot of the times, it's easy to ignore that a, a ten minute video could have been made in the past three months when you didn't have your uh, your your mental breakdowns, or mm. you just had a you just had a week where you felt good and you could pump out two or three videos, and and during the rest of the week you were just filled with antidepressants. Like you don't really know anything about these people, just what they want you to see. Yeah, yeah. Uh, look, it's it's uh, it's easy to be led along by <clears throat> something that's both entertaining and perfect, right? It's kind of like watching uh, the guys watch action movies from the eighties, where the hero perfectly you know destroys all these people and he never he always wins in the end and everything goes in the direction of success in his life right and the woman's romance movies that everything like this there's, there's no reality it's all kind of works out perfectly and when you watch some of these content creators they the content creators that they find something that works they just groundhog day that very specific loop that they've worked out and they just keep looping and making the same kind of content and the same kind of answers and you know a, a guy has a a question about women or relationships and they'll give the same kind of almost like brand answer that is their particular brand and, and we've see, we've talked about this with certain content creators that are very um very popular they don't give a similar answer with different words in real time they will literally word for word like a comedian giving you a well-rehearsed routine they will give you their perfect cookie cutter groundhog day uh dissertation on a specific idea and it's repetitive it's 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 done via rote it's not done via conversation where both the the content creator is growing by making content in real time as he's evolving and he's being a mentor as he's evolving because every time he might talk about, okay, when a woman does this, this is what I think, his conversation doesn't evolve and he doesn't give nuanced answers over time. He gives the exact same answer and that's comforting to people. It's, it's like you get the same Campbell soup cam from the, from the supermarket. Everyone likes it. And this guy, this content creator, gives you exactly the same brand of soup because everyone likes his particular brand of soup. And he can make money from it. And it's correct and it works and everyone likes the flavor. Um, so as the content creator, you think you're right because you've got a product and a meme response that works really well and it works for you. But you keep going back back to it. And so you're not sort of taking that 
that solution that you found when you broke up that really helped you break through, you're not taking it forward and sharpening it and and conversing with it. No, like that you like giving a cookie cutter answer and your audience love that same cookie cutter answer that you've been repeating the last five years. Well, it, it's easy to pretend to be the cock of the walk when you're on camera, isn't it? When when in reality, you're the walk of the cock. It, it, it's so easy to look at uh, a very segmented part of, of something, particularly when the solutions are so general that everybody can implement them. It could, it, it, always, it, it always boils down to the same cookie cutter answers for everything. And when it doesn't work, oh, you just haven't been doing that enough or you just haven't been going to the right places or you need to you need to work more. Well, if the solution to something is you always need to work more and there is no genuine uh, end of the road for you, like what does that say about the solution? It, it, it's not a particularly good solution because it's a it, it's pretty much a treadmill that's never going to break down. Like it doesn't matter how far you run. There's always uh, there's there's always more road in front of you. Like that's not a solution. It doesn't That's a good anymore. analogy, actually. That's a good analogy about the treadmill that never breaks down. Yeah, it doesn't matter if you're in a car, if you're in a plane. It doesn't matter how fast you move. You're never, you're never going to, you're never going to end your journey. So, so what's the point then? At least if you would get closer to to a checkpoint or something, it would make sense. But the focus isn't on uh, on making. P, uh, on making individuals develop as people, it's on the ideology. And if you're just fighting for ideology, it's very easy to kind of muddy the waters and never have a and never have a goal in mind. Well, like, that's oh, yeah, important. We need- uh, that's important about the ideology princ- uh, concept that you gave because the actual uh, the social media aspect of whatever channel you have on whatever platform is. You, you you have a message like you found a breakthrough in a certain period of life. Say it's about breakups. You had a breakup in a certain way and you've got these insights, genuine insights you came to. Say you put them on a YouTube video and people resonate with it and you got a particular experience and voice that was genuine. You amass followings and now the algorithm or the likes and your audience, now you have to retain that audience. And so the content creator is just trying to keep his audience by re- regurgitating the past over and over and over again, being frozen in that snapshot, he doesn't grow. He doesn't talk differently. Neither does his audience. So everyone is frozen in time. Everyone's on that treadmill that goes nowhere because you the, the content creator wants to retain what he's built. He wants to tr- retain the correctness of his solution that he keeps repeating to everyone. And the... Um, the repetitive content and the 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 growth of his audience that want that safe church response from him, they, they want that same sermon on Sunday every time they show up to his channel. Everything points in the direction of no one's growing. Everyone's going to the same church, listening to the same hymn all the time. And it takes a lot for someone to counterintuitively say, no, no, I am going to grow because that's what I that's what started my channel. My, I started my channel because I said, fuck it, I want to grow. I put something out that was honest. So my conversation should be growing all the time. I'm not going to let my audience or anyone or fear or censoring myself uh, stop. My my growth is the most important thing. Me sharpening you know, the, the the edges that I need to sharpen in my life, me having the courage to let go of things that I really know I should let go of. And it comes back to that uh, thing we were talking about earlier about the, th- the fork in the road. Are you going to take the left turn again and just give your audience the McDonald's that they want? Or will you turn right and give yourself what you know you should have? And, and to further that point, since, since you brought it back a bit, uh, you also mentioned the example of guys constantly thinking about their exes and, oh, if they could see me now, uh, they're going to regret it. I, I do have a question. And um, d- do you think if that situation would happen to you, do you think that your moment of of, uh, of vengeance would be what you expected it to be? or Or would it fall flat on its ass? 
because there are so many assumptions when you have that type of fetish that, oh, she thought about me during this time. Uh, she, she still remembers me. She's still going to recognize me because uh, I still look the same way I did 30, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago. Or I just maintained my my good looking features and, and she's going to recognize those. Like th There's just so much that comes into that particular type of type of idea. And I think that for most guys, that type of uh, that type of interaction would mostly fall flat on its ass. It does. And uh, I, I can say it's happened to me at least three times in the past where what you think sweet revenge would be. It's completely different and it just feels like you want to get out of there straight away. It's never the utopia you think it's going to be. It's never the closure or the revenge or the mic drop that you think it's going to be. Never is. And I can think back to at least three or a few different points where I did have that revenge moment or the girl my ex came back and I was in a, uh, you know, I was over her. I looked better. I was in better shape. I was confident. I was with someone else or if I wasn't. And it it was never the sweet revenge I thought it was going to be. Most of the times it felt like uh, it was embarrassing. I, I wanted to kind of get out of there straight away. Um, it was intrusive to my life or it felt like I was touching a sticky doorknob. It just didn't feel good at all. Yeah, I think if it would happen maybe one week or, or a month when the wounds are still fresh. Yeah, sure. And th then you'd probably get a bit more dopamine out of it. But if it happens years later, I, I, I think Spetsnaz uh, told this story. I've seen it in, in multiple YouTube videos with the with the Buddhist monks where they say, oh, you're still carrying that girl. I, I left her back at the river and you're still carrying her. It's why are you still carrying this thing? 10 years after the relationship was over or two or three, four years, well, whatever the time period is, like you're, you're still carrying the trauma and, and the weight and, and everything else. You're making this person so special in your life that now years later, you're still thinking about her and she could, she could have not had one thought of you since the second she decided to say goodbye and vice versa. Yeah, sure. Like uh, I've often thought about that. I, I think it's just something primal about feeling something with a woman. So you'll tend to always uh, flash your mind back to what is the last intense feeling you had with an ex-girlfriend. And a lot of times it's the pain, it's the breakup, it's when you were in love. But it's always with the last girlfriend. And I used to remember when, whenever I was, you know, you know, past them, you know, I was single, it's been a few years, and I always think back to the last girlfriend. I never want revenge on three girlfriends before. It's always the last one. And I think it's the familiarity of the closest thing in the past to you where you had the, the girlfriend experience, that primal connection with a woman, the comfort, the warmth, is you want the revenge of that or you want to you want to feel something. So it could have been a bad feeling, good feeling, but you just want to recreate it. Uh, I can't explain it, but I always found it funny that I, when I did have that dumb revenge fantasy, it was always with the, usually the last girlfriend, however many years passed. And then the moment you get another one, you forget about the previous one, the, the, the revenge fantasy goes away. And then if you break up with that, that one, the revenge fantasy is always with the immediate preceding girlfriend. It's kind of weird, but maybe I'm the only one that felt that. No, I, I, I think that's. I'm kind of the same way, so I think it's similar for a lot of guys. Unless, obviously, you had something really horrible happen with uh, a previous girlfriend that you just can't let go of. And it, and it's usually those types of experiences that you let sour everything else in, in your life. You, mm. I've I've noticed a lot of the times, at least with me, when uh, when I've had breakups, when I've had things like that happen, and it's something that's um, that's hard to control, you tend to assume that the things that your new partner says or does are done with the same intent that your ex used to do them. Like they're <laughs> done with malice or they're done with, oh, she's she's not saying that I look good. She's actually being sarcastic right now, even though it's genuine. You, you always have that thing at the back of your mind where you uh, paste the 
uh, the defaults of your ex onto your new partner. And it's really, really hard to get out of that mindset a lot of the times. Well, it's not conscious, man. Like I, I can, I think guys don't willingly want to whip themselves like that. It's, it's similar to you could have traumatic responses to females because of the way your mother treated you and the dynamic you had with her. And that always pastes itself over every interaction you have with another woman when it's kind of close or intimate or trusting or whatever. So it takes a lot of repetitive work to wear down that automatic response. So you know, I don't. I, I feel a level of sympathy because every one of us has those automatic responses. Uh, I, I've, I marveled at some friends when we were dating when I was a young adult and they found it effortless and they were really relaxed. And I was uh, scared shitless in a lot of uh, areas of not saying the right, right, uh, the right thing or uh, making her unhappy or trying to keep a woman happy. And a lot of that is um, connected to your upbringing and, and things like that. Whereas my friends, they, they were talking to girls like they were just talking to another guy. And I thought, ah, oh, why do I feel like this? I hate it and I don't want to. I, I don't act this way in front of every anyone else except a girl I like. And I know there's a lot of natural biology there, but when I look at guys that aren't, and then when you start looking at them and you find out about their the way they were raised and I, I, I look at how I was raised and just a, a lot of stuff starts to fall into place. But a lot of that stuff is automatic, man. Um, I can't really, it's not an excuse. Uh, all I will say, it's very important to find out where it might have come from, to see it, and then to do your best to wear it out, like constant repetition at the gym, wear out the automatic response and replace it with something else. You see, but isn't it interesting that when you're in one of those situations and, and you're going through one of these processes that's automatic, it's it's that you never realize that you don't have a problem. You are the problem at that point. <laughs> it, yeah and, and it's always oh well it's it's because my ex treated me that way it's because of whatever whatever the excuse is i'm just a nice point, guy exactly <laughs> it, it's never you're never the problem it doesn't matter what you do how you act it's always easy to push that responsibility onto someone else and it's like no at, at that point whether you like it or not you are the problem and, and right now yeah. you're hurting someone because you, because of your past experiences. It's something that you need to fix. It doesn't matter what the 10 steps before that were. It doesn't matter that mommy didn't touch you when you were younger. It doesn't matter that your your girlfriend used to do something bad to you when it happened to trigger you. At that point in time, your reaction made you the problem. You're the cause of what happened. Yeah, that's why I think there's a big resistance in a lot of this uh, self-help victimhood kind of a uh, centered narrative or, or solutions. And there's there's such a resistance to the, the guys that uh, espouse, you know, everything is your responsibility. You are the sum total of uh, what you're doing and where you are. A and uh, a lot of guys will point to, well, I didn't cheat on me. My ex did this or I got fired. I didn't do that. And the more self-ownership you take, just the better your life is and the more control you have and the less of a victim you feel, even if it is subjective. Okay, we can all acknowledge that when someone does us wrong, but I think it's a much better posture to assume that everything and wherever you are, you have a chance to speak up, you have a choice to say yes or no, you can tell the woman the fuck off or work things out. It's not just the science giving you the answers and then you respond to the science, you respond to what is correct. You respond to responsibility. But you need to add on to that the potential that, or, or not the potential, the idea that everyone is also going to hurt you. Because th this is a point that the manosphere, I think, I think oftentimes forget. Like, it doesn't matter if you're talking to a friend, if you're talking to a family member, or you're talking to a woman. Chances are that at some point, they're going to hurt you, whether it's um, it, it, it's a it's a big hurt, something that will take you a long while to get to, whether it's if it's a minor disappointment or or whatever it is. 
everybody at some point is going to cause you harm, whether it's unconscious or not. And, and the problem is that most of these guys want to go through life with a, with a barrier around them that protects them from every little thing that's going on. But you can't get an umbrella against everyone. The, the only thing that's going to get rid of uh, that's going to get rid of that is a grave, whether you like it or not. And I, I think that the the solution to that is just either not engaging with anyone, which is a potential solution, or finding the individuals that do their best to try not to hurt you or finding people for which it's worth suffering, for which living is worth suffering for. Well, I, I do have a question, actually. What, what were some of the things that you did this year that were unexpected that you've enjoyed or some of the things that you didn't enjoy before and now you did because of your of your new circumstances or, or something that surprised you? Well, the biggest surprise was uh, when I met Stephanie. I did something I never did before, but I finally did it because I always wanted to. And that was take a courageous step when it felt completely right. And in the past, I would stop myself and, you know, not just measure measure twice and cut once, but measure 5,000 times before I would even consider cutting. And then the opportunity has gone. But at that point, I really trusted my instincts. I got to a point where I wanted to be honest about like what was in front of me. And uh, that was a big change because um, I don't know if a lot of people know that I, I, I met her via chatting online, just a platonic conversation via email, and it grew into something else. And she lived on the other side of the planet. And so deciding to to sort of go and see her wasn't frivolous, and it's not something I do. I don't throw away not even hundreds of dollars on some sort of question mark, but I was certain about how I felt and what this was and not letting an opportunity go. And what changed for me was like just realizing how important it is to have courage for the things you really believe in. Like I really believed in us and me and her and like what it was. I saw it clearly. It wasn't something given to me like, here's a template that the Manosphere gives you and this will lead to a Ferrari and a, a business. It's like, it wasn't a an archetype. It was something very real and tangible and personal. I kind, I kind of felt it. And it was the first time I had courage for something I like in such a big way that I always wanted to feel and do. And I got the opportunity and I just jumped at it. And it was what I thought it would be and so much more just because I trusted myself. So the ability to kind of have the courage for what was important to me and only me, that was something that was a, a real kind of um, real edifying moment for me, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you also didn't look back, did you? Like you decided to look to look at the potential future. You decided to take a risk. You didn't look back on all of the on all of the bad and the potential bad things that could have happened. No, no, no. It's almost like at that point and then even afterwards till now, it's kind of like I trust that my past has got me. All the information I know, women, relationships, like I'm, I'm fairly knowledgeable in a lot of these sort of things that they were always like, it's going to be there. It's protecting me. It's got my back. Now, all there is, is the present moment, judging it and having the courage to kind of do and say what I know is right and not lie to myself. And then there's kind of now and the future, but not looking, the past is informative. I can take out snapshots. I can read notes of what was important to me in my journal and my mental sort of um, filing cabinet. But, you know, the, the, the sort of courage to kind of use it and, and and that was what was really liberating. All these guys that learn dating tips and learn all this information about what happened, like a post-mortem of their past. And then they've learned it. They know what happened. And then they get another relationship and they think it's the same thing. They get slung, slingshot to the past and they think it's just another version of the woman who decimated them when they were much more naive. Well, now you're not naive. This is a different person. And it's kind of just the courage to 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 
know that you're not going to be hurt like the person 10 years ago or, or something like that, especially if you've got your eyes open. But it's it's hard to put into words, Karu, but other than it, it, it was a real teaching moment for me to to be able to be courageous and take a calculated risk and just the rewards and the pride you get afterwards and the self-confidence to know that, no, no, I can make these decisions. And look what happens when I finally have the courage not to lie to myself and to do what's right and not just to go back into the comfort zone and, you know, go online and regurgitate old thoughts and repeat things that give me comfort and things like that. And uh, yeah, it was just, it was great. And and now it's almost like you have to counter in, counterintuitively remind yourself in every moment where you feel like, oh, no, I'm going to naturally take a left turn. It's like, well, hang on a minute. This could be a right turn. Like, this is a really good right turn. Yeah, but it's, you know, it's <laughs> like conserve energy, go left. You know what to do. It was like, what do you want? Do you really want to go right? It's like, hang on a minute. Maybe I really do. And uh, <laughs> Stephanie was an opportunity where right just really seemed like there was no downsides. When I looked at why aren't I taking the right turn in, like, it, it, not that it did, but if that little thought crept in when I was at the crossroads of Stephanie, it was kind of like, well, this feels like another one of those, this feels like deja vu. And the only reason why I'm not picking right is because I'm worried and it's not perfect and it's not familiar. I, I'm just afraid. But there's actually no objective reason why I shouldn't. There was nothing objectively saying, well, if if I was my own best friend, there was no excuse I could say, well, it's because of this human. This is actually an objective reason why you shouldn't turn right. And then I could say, you know what, that's, that's a reason to not go and see her or not start a relationship. But there's actually none. I was trying to, everything in me was trying to turn left to the manosphere and my history and my comfort to just stay the way I was because it was easy. But on the right turn of Stephanie at that moment, I was being given everything I wanted and I was just kind of being stubborn and safe and kind of afraid to take the, it was even barely a risk. There was no risk other than just take a step in that direction. And, and once I did it, I, I realized how how much w warmer the water is than everyone thinks it is. How much water, warmer the water was than I thought it was. I thought the water was freezing. It was actually great. And in the back of my mind, I knew it would be, but I looked for every excuse not to do it. <laughs> it it's really interesting because I've been, uh, I've been listening to you and for the past uh, minute or so that you've been talking, I've been, I've been smiling like an idiot. Like we, <laughs> we've been talking for, for long enough um, for, for the past couple of years that I, I think I've kind of gotten a, a bit of a grasp on how you normally converse. And I could feel the emotion when you were when you were talking about this situation. I, oh, like, oh. I, I bet you I bet you I was talking about this like I talk about my keyboards. <laughs> I'm not even close. <laughs> like you can try to backpedal that one, but it's not gonna work. <laughs> <laughs> and and it was you, you could I, I don't know if the uh, if anyone watches this can tell, but I could feel the difference between the way you were talking about Stephanie and then you went into manosphere mode when you went back to talking about the crossroads and then you went back to the emotion <laughs> and it, it was really, really great to watch. And it was, uh, it, it was a very sweet moment. <laughs> well, th this is the difference. Well, well, this is also something very important, the nuance of being able to tell the difference and, and, and being able to tell what's in front of you. you. Like you were listening to the difference of what's in front of you, Karu. And when people might, might watch my streams, they can kind of see the difference when I go on different topics. And when I'm referring to information, when I'm reflecting on the past or whether, when I'm in the present moment in real time telling you who I am and what I think. And I, and I think kind of courage trumps information. Like all of this stuff from the Manosphere, I just talked about the, the thing I learned is the courage to do what is right and not lie to myself. And when, you know, whether life gives you everything you wanted, but you're just going to be suspicious and say, no, 
in, in effect, you, you're doubting your own judgment. If I'm so smart and I know what the answers are and then life gives me the answers and puts it on a silver platter and I'm still skeptical, I don't even trust my own judgment and then I still don't pick it, what does that say about me? It's, it's kind of embarrassing. Then what am I going to do? Look for the excuses of hypergamy and female nature to excuse my cowardice? Especially if I should know better. I should be a Jedi in relation to this. But if I don't act like one in the situation, if I just say, well, the numbers say this, so no matter what I think and whatever's in front of me, it can't be true. Everything is a mirage. Yes. Well, you can view it from that perspective because it's it's easy to look at yourself like the guy in the ivory tower. They can see through the fabric of reality. But at the same time, you also need to answer the question if you're comfortable with losing everything else, because you could you could feel the glee, you could feel the emotion, you could feel uh, the actual human human coming out of human when you had the speech before. <laughs> and right now, like the dissertation that you had after that. Yeah, OK, it's data. It's, it's having a conversation. It's everything else. It doesn't have that raw emotion that you can just feel behind behind the words. Like they mm. don't have to be Shakespearean in any way, shape or form, but you could tell that certain things that you said genuinely brought you happiness. They, they brought you back to a, they brought you back to a good place. They gave you good memories. Mm. And the question then becomes, well, are you really willing to lose all of that for the potential to be right, not even the certainty to be right for the potential to be right about something? Because you can have anyone here taking a bet on, well, well, you know what? She's going to leave human and he's and he's going to be sad and he's going to be back in the manosphere saying the same things that he said 20 years ago. Like you mentioned about the the the, the vitality and, and, and the, the meaning behind my words and uh, how honest sort of, uh, you know, it was coming through, how I was talking about Stephanie and, you know, being courageous and what it meant to me and all those things. You know, th that's the kind of things I, I, I hope to, to sort of uh, give guys the impression of if I can. Um, I, it's not my intent, but like I'm happy when they come out. And even in a smaller way, I was joking about talking about microphones or, or keyboards. They're just honest passion you have about something that's not sort of scaffolded by numbers and stats. It's just what makes you come alive and what makes you feel right and what makes you feel uh, like your world is held together properly and you're in control. Like... This, the decisions I made with Stephanie might be counterintuitive to everyone else, but I don't care. I don't care what the numbers say to other people. Um, I, I don't care what, you know, people are just waiting for things to fail. I, I really don't. Uh, and any more than a guy who ran a business that he enjoyed, it failed. And later on, people say, well, it failed. It's like, yeah, well, I ran a business and I had a great, and like there were experiences and I had that moment in time. But you, you know what I mean? Well, it's what I said before. A business is going gonna, is gonna to be successful or it's going to fail. Like those are the two options that you have. Like you're not impressive if you're going to predict that the business is going to fail. Well, good for you. It, you're, you're, you're taking a bet on a coin toss. Like that's not, that, that's not impressive. Oh, if you have 2,000 different outcomes and you manage to pick the right one, okay, then, then maybe I can, uh, uh, I, I can say that you're impressive. But when it comes to things like this, it's like, dude, come on. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not something that I can look at and say, oh, this guy has some form of, uh, of deeper knowledge or that he has some, some type of predictive ability. It's like, no, come on, leave me the hell alone. That's, that's fucking stupid. Like they, well, there was, um, there was a picture that M Mr. White sent me and, and the quote on it was, uh, uh, if, if you look back on your, uh, on your younger self and you can tell you're an idiot, you're probably still an idiot. And I, I think that I think that quote is is really really true, and it gets to a heart. It gets to the heart of a lot of the things that are uh, are put forward within the manosphere.
Well, to me, just objectively speaking, right, we, we want to feel sure and we, we don't want to keep making mistakes. But the, the, the kind of the most shallow way to, to do that is to adhere stubbornly to something that worked when you were a teenager and never budge. Because a lot of us, you know, if you pose it that way, if you haven't, if you're the same person you were when you were 20 and now you're 50, you don't necessarily need to change who you are. But if you're running off the same template, you're essentially running off the template that a 20 year old guy set for you and you're a 50 year old man, which is kind of stupid. It's, it's to kind of say that, you know, when Picasso picked up a paintbrush, I don't know, say it was when he was 12 and he knew he had a gift for it, that he didn't evolve or get better. He just remained at the same level of painting at 12 and to when he was 60. Even if he's talented, you'd expect him to get better and evolve and sharpen and throw away the old and, and you know, go up certain levels and expand and uh, have a wealth of experience and mistakes by which to, you know, go forward and create new paths and things like that. So I understand the safety and you don't want to keep making the same mistakes again, but make new mistakes with the honesty that you're trying something else and you want to find out if this works for you. Um, but I, I just think people are, and especially with the groups, I under, one thing that I started to get dis disillusioned about the little pockets of the manosphere, which I, you know, I, I don't hate them, but when I couldn't talk as an individual and I couldn't ask my own questions and I couldn't, I couldn't find the answers to the passion I was speaking to you about before, when you when you heard me talking about the, the what I learned and and what I discovered when I took the took the steps to kind of meet her and like really made my life into something that I wanted and it, it was the right thing and I trusted myself. When I started to when I was trying to ask questions that would help me find some of those answers, I was immediately pulled back into the crab of buckets and I wasn't allowed to ask questions. Uh, in these little groups, and I started to realize that I'm never gonna, I'm never gonna be happy with these guys if I have to uh, act like a lemming. And I, I just started to realize that these organized groups are just a consensus of excuses. That's all they are. It's just a graveyard of a graveyard of dreams. It's uh, and it, it was really annoying. Like, and I can't feel alive in a graveyard where these guys are just in the past all the fucking time. And again, I, I hope guys take me the right way. I'm not sort of bad mouthing anyone who might find it useful, especially a lot of parts of the manosphere. They're completely useful to find out where you're going to be calibrated. But if you're not going to calibrate yourself and you're just going to stay in that kind of groundhog day of cons safe consensus, um, I just knew. My uh, the group of guys, I was just freezing myself in time and I was going to be a 50-year-old guy using the template of a 30-year-old guy that found the Manosphere. Well, you always have the choice of taking the things that broke your heart to fix your mind. And mm. I think a lot of the times that's being ignored. They just take the They just take the heartbreak and they don't ask, how can I fix it? They ask, how can I avoid this? Yes. So those are two very different questions. Like, yeah. It, are, are you going to use this, use this really important, terrible thing? Because it is like it's, you've got no excuse. Like you, you can't avoid it. It's happening now. You've got heartbreak. She left you. She did whatever. Are you going to use this? Are you going to really use this thing that you can't avoid? So then later on, you don't keep avoiding it. Really use it. Pull it apart. Throw away what you don't need, but find the useful stuff in it. So then next time you have a relationship, you know what useful parts to, 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 to keep so that your life in the future is constructive rather than defensively destructive because you're just avoiding. You confuse the lessons you learned and you interpret that in terms of, well, I'll just avoid even doing that ever again, and therefore that's the solution. For me, that's the, the most pitiful solution. You've learned nothing. Like you said, all you've learned to do is avoid. Well, you can learn how to swim or you can just avoid water for the rest of your life. <laughs> it's just that easy. And, and, it, and it seems that each time that there's, um, uh, that, that, that there's a duality 
guys tend to forget that uh, you can't define one part of it without the other. Like, you can tell what light is without having darkness. And it's the same with, uh, with pain and happiness. You can't know when you're happy if you, if you haven't had pain in your life. Mm. Oh, well, you, now you've learned what pain is. How about you go about fixing it and finding what happiness is like? How about you go and see what contentment is like rather than having this, this constant turmoil going on in your soul? But I suppose the natural inclination is the path of least resistance, and the path of least resistance is um, a group of guys who understand you and see you. Like, because previously you were heartbroken, your wife didn't see you, society doesn't see you, you're invisible, your pain's invisible. All of a sudden, you enter a space where people see your situation perfectly, and it's the first time you're seen and you feel alive and understood, and you can work things out. And then that's the trap as well. You have to counterintuitively decide to step away from your buddies and the world that understands you and go out into that world alone again and interact. And it seems like, why the fuck would I? I'm running away from that world to make sense of it. Like, why would I want to go back? It's um, But, but, but they're running and living in imagination. Like, uh, outside of what's happening now, and and I'm I'm using this in a very um, in a very specific way. O- outside of what we're doing now, you're on your chair talking to me on on the internet, and I'm on my chair talk talking to you. Everything that we talk beyond this point, e- every idea that we talk about, any memory that we talk about, any um, any future prediction that we make, it's all imagination. Yep. Like you, you, you can talk about the past as much as you want. You, you can try to re- relive the pain that you lived uh, 10 or 15 years ago. You're still imagining the pain. Yeah, you can bring back some of those, some of those sentiments. But the only thing that is genuinely happening is what you're doing now at this present moment in time. Yep. Everything else, it, it, it's completely irrelevant. And if it doesn't have any effect on you because you're good, you're exactly where you are now. You're no longer in that place. Why are you? Why are you making such a such a, such a huge fu- such a huge fuss over it? And why are you making assumptions based on things you have no no genuine experience with? Like even we, we've talked about this before, where where you've. Uh, you know, where we've mentioned that guys kind of tend to date the same type of person over and over and over again. Mm. Even with that, you're assuming that just because Jane looks similar to Alice, that they're going to have the same problems. You're assuming that they're going to have the same mental issues and that they're going to act with you in the exact same way and so on and so forth. Even that is imagination. Yeah, you may make a, an informed prediction based on something. But until you don't go and you don't experience it, it it's all probability. That's what num- That's what stats are. They're probability. Oh, yeah, you may have a high likelihood of something happening. It's not a 100% guarantee. And that, that sort of empirical, like subjective choice, you know, I can understand men looking to science and numbers because we guys really appreciate testing their reality against the world which you should like there should be an objective assessment right to a certain degree but when it comes to relationships your friends what you choose what really makes you particularly come alive and give your life meaning your routines your particular hobbies i mean no one can tell you what hobby to find to 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 really look forward to getting up for your little idiosyncratic things you tinker with, Karu, or that I do, they're very personal. And in the same way, the all the little ways you tinker with personalities and what fits with you with Chicky Poo on a date, it's it's similar as well. And so the fact that the the manosphere try to force a a template onto everyone, it's kind of like here's a template to feel emotionally a ten all the time, and it doesn't work. It is not an object. It's a feeling, yes. and your feelings are subjective. And and 
they resist it because, you know, women do feelings, guys don't. Well, that's why you have such problems in dating. That's why you feel heartbreak probably more than women, because you refuse to get better with the language of knowing how you feel and improving the results of all of that going forward. Yeah, there's a huge difference between us talking about uh, what, what the what the perfect cog to put in a machine would be, what, what type of uh, material it needs to be made out of, how fast it can spin, what type of forces interact on it. Like that, that's very, um, in, in a lot of ways, it's very predictable for, for guys and it's, um, uh, it's also appreciated because it shows a form of competence. Oh, I know exactly the part that's going to fit in this. That's going to fit in this exact place, and everything is going to work perfectly. Well, it it doesn't work like that with other people, and it doesn't work like that with other guys that you have in your life. Mm. You you've had instances in your life where your male friends acted in ways that you thought they would they never will before. And you're looking at them like, oh, my God, who the hell is this person? What ha what happened to uh, Timothy over there? What what the hell came over him? Like you're not interacting with a machine, you're interacting with people. Yeah. And, and for for all the knowledge that you say you have and, and you like to say that, oh, well, women are irrational and, and whatever else and they're more emotional. Well, you you have some you have a, a thing that, you know, is going to act erratic from time to time. Why is that a surprise for you? Like, you already know this. And yet here yeah. you are trying to put that erratic behavior in a box. Yeah, and at the same time, not realizing that you're imperfect. I mean, most of the guys in the manosphere can quite, you know, properly find it like ridiculous how how perfect women judge men like he has to be this he has to do. there's all these really high standards they expect a man to be to the point where they won't find a man but men are doing the same things with their cookie cutter perfection like they don't realize that a, a woman's going to have her own faults and quirks and things like that she's not going to be perfect the, the the most important thing is the compatibility and she ticks the very important things that are essential for you to get along with anyone why you feel the way you do and then all the other stuff you can probably live with but these kind of nuanced things these discussions that aren't cookie cutter no one wants to have them because they're very stochastic they're very subjective and guys don't like like subjectivity they like objectivity and they'll continue to plow ahead through an objective approach to relationships rather than using the objectivity, but largely after that, you know, insisting on a subjective understanding of how they date. Oh, and, and you, you've you touched on something that I think is, uh, is very important because when you look at the similarities between people when they get together, like, yeah, they have a lot of things in common. Uh, like we we get along because we like keyboards, we like the various <laughs> tech things and so on and so forth. But at the same time, th there comes a very different question. Do you think those are the only things you have in common with your friends? Do you think schizophrenics don't get along with other schizophrenics or people that don't have uh, similar types of trauma or mental issues don't get along with people that have the same types of issues? Because they have a lot in common specifically because of those problems. And, and chances are that if you're you're a guy in your circle with, I don't know, BPD, chances are you have a bunch of other people with BPD in your, in your social circle that you may not be aware of. And here you are taking the advice of these other people. Oh, look, and yeah. They, and they look, may have it's... the same issues that you do or even worse. Yeah, it's very common. I mean, I don't think it takes a brainiac to, to figure out and see just by observation that a lot of people think they're compatible or they bond through trauma. You know, the, the amount of couples like they get together, they have a conversation it's like, oh, I got my heart broken by my ex. I got my heart broken by my ex. And all of a sudden they bond because they trust each other through that really traumatic experience. And it would be the same with people who are schizophrenic or whatever I'd imagine. There's that it's a very important bond, you know, whatever moment in your life was important or whatever thing you suffer through, if you meet a person that suffers through it or experiences it the same way you do, that that's a huge understanding and a huge bond between the two of you. But again, this stuff isn't talked about. 
in the dating world, which is really stupid. But And this is the important stuff to realize about yourself in relation to others. Like, is this real compatibility or is this trauma coping? Is this um, an involuntary response that's actually going to set you backwards and make you embarrassed of where this leads in the future and you have no answers for it. So th this kind of stuff, I, I wish they would have more conversations about how to think and uh, how to how to self-reflect rather than cookie cutter, you know, one, two, three dating steps as though we're changing a carburetor on the car. Uh, but that's boring, dude. Like if, if you don't tell me how much you bench at the gym, it's irrelevant. Because then I can tell you, you didn't bench enough and that's why you're not getting any girl in your life. Yeah, and I can't sell you a course on this conversation. <laughs> how can how can I print off a course templated that everyone goes, yeah, that's exactly what I want. No, no. What you want is a conversation where you discover what you want. But yeah, I because like per, Yeah, because personal problems don't have general solutions. Exactly. The, the, the only guy that can fix a certain issue that you have most likely went through that problem or or, or has some experience with it. Like, you're not going to go and ask um, uh, a carpenter to fix your plumbing issue. Yeah, they may be able to put some wood around your pipes and make it stop leaking and, and, and even make a, I don't know, a wooden funnel so it fixes the issue for a while. But ideally, you want a plumber to fix that thing. And it's the same with social issues. It's the same with dating. It's the same with everything else. Like it, As much as I like... Uh, is I like Boffin, I would not go to Boffin for dating advice. Not because he's he's unintelligent, but he just lived in a different. I wouldn't come to you for dating advice. Mm. Like you, you know nothing about my country. First of all, you know nothing about the types of women that are here, and and beyond the the, the general things that you're aware of. Like there is nothing that you really know about the environment, the things that they like over here, the things that they don't like. Yeah, obviously you can go back to what we talked about before. Oh, they like tall guys. They like thick guys. They like these general things and so on and so forth. But when it comes to the culture, when when it comes to how they act, when it comes to the things that they that they enjoy, like you know nothing about that. Now, not not only that. It's like, what, what can Boffin tell me? Because he used to invite people to the dance or to the local, whatever it was back in his day. And now people get together on Tinder or on Instagram or whatever. He just has no overlap with that type of environment. And even if he has overlap with that environment, he doesn't have overlap with the age group. Like There are so, yeah. there are so many factors that are different, even between... Uh, my father and I, there's a huge, huge generational gap when it comes to dating. And and, and a lot of the times, yeah, you, you can have some uh, some advice that overlaps. Yeah, oh, everybody probably likes someone that's nice to them. Everybody likes to be treated well. Well, even that's changed because now treating well, in, in some cases, is, is uh, cleaning the toilet after you take a dump. Because believe it or not, I've talked to girls that were complaining that none of their boyfriends know how to clean the toilet after after they do something. And these weren't some low class guys or low class gals that I'm talking about. Yeah. Uh, and I want I want to touch on uh, something you mentioned just a, a short while ago. That's, I think, very important. It's that you, you, you quite rightly observed and you're self-aware enough to know that I'm, you're not going to take dating advice from me. You'll talk with me. You'll talk with Boffin. But in order for you to chew on it yourself and come up with your own solutions, that's what mentoring used to be. That's what good conversations used to be. And that's why today almost everyone just sees therapy as a solution because therapy is the same thing. You go out, you go and figure your own problems out and the therapist shouldn't be telling you what to do any more than any of us should be telling you what to do. But these templated conversations that they have in the Manosphere and these dating coaches, they're having templated conversations where open ones are needed. And the open ones, like you mentioned, you're not going to template your dating life to what I tell you or Boffin tells you. You're going to talk with us, bounce off the ideas, and then hear yourself stand up righteously to what you believe in. You go, yeah, but I disagree with that Boffin or human because the women here are blah, blah, blah. And that self-righteous 
choice and knowing what's different and knowing what you want, that's what comes out or should come out of these conversations, not templated conversations, forcing and shaming people to do it one way, and everyone keeps falling on their face. And you also need to look at the results of, of a lot of the things that the Manosphere talks about, because this is what I find funny. Did, do you know those pictures that were posted, uh, that used to be posted a long time ago with the Manosphere, where they used to show uh, a classroom full of girls, and they were all blondes, they all had blue sweaters, and they all had a MacBook? And they got, oh, look, all women are the same. Well, I look at the Manosphere, bald guys in their 50s with beards, and they're all trying to hit the gym. Like, <laughs> and, and they never see the the similarities between the two. Like, what the hell? Like, there's a there's a bit of an inconsistency here between the two. As much as they don't like to admit it, we're we're far more similar than we're different. <laughs> it's just well, different it's, ways of expressing it. Well, it's 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 a difference between noticing the similarities and then also being aware of yourself as an individual, like. Another person that might be well-meaning, like a content creator, they're, they're not the food. They're not the food you want. They're the buffet that you go to when you cherry pick what to put on your plate. You, you're supposed to know what works and what doesn't. Or if you don't, you, you don't take the person as religion, as God. You take them as a buffet and you go there and you try certain things. You put things on your plate. You you find out what you do and don't want. You find out what you are, what your tastes are. Like you said, you know that you're not going to take someone's advice like mine or Boffin's or even the, the closest person in your life. You can trust people like that, but you have to trust yourself the most. You have to make your final decision yourself. If you can't trust your own empirical experience and filter it through, no, this is going to be my choice. Because how stupid, like you intuitively know that if you make my choice, you are going to fuck up and then you pointing the finger at me is going to, just going to seem stupid. You're self-aware enough to know that if you fuck up <laughs> based on my decision, you're going to say, well, human, I did this and I'm going to laugh and I say, why? If you fuck up with a woman, like with the woman I tell you to choose, with what you I tell you to be attracted to, and then you hate the experience, and then you blame me, it's like, why? Yeah, and there's a difference between somebody recognizing what your preferences are, or even somebody being cognizant of the things that would, uh, that would work for you, and wholeheartedly taking their solution as a as an all-encompassing thing in your life like yeah there are i'm convinced that there are things that uh, people in my life see about me that i that i would never be uh aware of and yeah chances are that my my father or my mother they can tell if uh a certain individual or a certain friend is a is, is good for me is a good influence is a good fit or, or if a potential, uh, or if potential woman is good for me or not, because mm. they're also capable of having this external view of, oh well, I, I can see why they get along. I can see why they wouldn't get along, or they can see things about her that I won't because I'm smitten. And it's always good to have that type of feedback. You mentioned earlier that um, uh, therapy a lot of the times is. Uh, is you working through and reaching your own solutions. Well, I think that there are times in life where it should be a therapist's job to tell you to get out of that situation. I, I think we talked about the situation that uh, Quaz was in when the therapist are, are, are outright told him, look, this person doesn't care at all about you, get out. And I think that there are moments in life when that is exactly what you need. Whether oh, it's sure. from your therapist, whether it's from your family, whether it's from every, for, from from anyone else, you you need sometimes you need that type of harsh feedback. Well, look, I've always said uh, I think therapy is a last resort where you don't have anyone in your life that you can trust and confide in. In that case, I think your only option if you really want to solve your problems and be honest and self-reflect through just bouncing off someone is through finding a good therapist. But the bottom line for me is to, to have the courage to do what you want to do. And all the knowledge can help you, 
But if you keep taking someone else's advice, you're relying on their courage to 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 sort of have the answers for you. You know, their courage, their answers. And then you, you can never have pride that it was your thing, that you discovered something. You didn't. You just took a template, you plugged it in. Uh, it was like a filter you put over an image and it gave you something beautiful, but you didn't actually create it yourself. If I look back on the last couple of years, is kind of um, the courage to do, even if you've got all this information and you know a lot of stuff, the courage to do what you want to do with the benefit of all this information trumps the information. The, the, don't let the information speak for you. Don't put a representative from the manosphere in front of you. Um, the courage to sort of answer it in your way and do what you want to do, it trumps all of that. And uh, having these kind of conversations with friends you have or starting a channel to, to have these conversations, I think they're a way to do it. Um, so for me, I, I've said before, my, my channel was a way of going instead of getting a therapist is to work my stuff out with and having these kind of, kind of conversations so I can figure them out myself. In the same way, you wouldn't take advice from me or Boffin, but you want to have the conversations to be able to figure it, your own things out. Um, Onto that, I would also add the, the the wisdom of realizing that regardless of how uh, how old or experienced you think you are, you can still be surprised and you can still learn yeah, I, I, yeah. I've, I've had an experience like that this year where I've mentioned this to you and Boff and I have uh, on two separate occasions, I've uh, seen various things that have elicited uh, feelings in me that I thought I, I have um, I, ha I have taken out of my uh, out of my existence for for lack of a better explanation. And I've had things elicited in me that I, I didn't think existed anymore. And it, it was one of those uncanny things of, oh, well, what the hell do I know? <laughs> like, I, yeah. I have never had the uh, drive before to to learn, to, to want to learn something for, for somebody else's benefit. And and I had this, um, th th this moment that I vividly remember when I watched someone and said, you know what? I'd like to learn to cook that thing for that person. And, it, and how no do you quantify that? How do, how do you do the math for that? You know, you oh, can't. it's very easy. Oh, no, it's very easy. You're a simp and you should go to hell. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and that's why I think these conversations are helpful and you can't make a course for it, but they're one of the most helpful things. Then you actually build your own course. Like everyone needs to write their own philosophy, but you can only do it through doing this kind of thing in, in this kind of way. And it's not templated, but unfortunately what sells is templates and people love groups and they feel safe and it's uh, safe to return to exactly the same blueprint group every time. As I said, I, I think they're just a, a consensus of excuses uh, and they're not your friends. Your friends aren't people. These people in groups that keep the crabs in the bucket that keep pulling you down, just like friends. If they don't allow you to ask questions and to be happy in maybe stepping outside and coloring out the lines, if they don't accept questions or you changing for your own accord or asking these questions, then they're really not your friends. They're not your buddies. Um, but anyway, like I, I, I need to wrap this up. I gotta, I'm gonna try and do this more often with you and the other guys and just hit record and and, and set a time because uh, this was kind of really nice. And uh, uh, I, I told you, I, I wanted to do that on purpose because I know it was out of your comfort zone. <laughs> but you know what it's like you, with guys, if you don't set something up, it's like me, if I just turn on the camera and hit record and I wanna make a video, I just flail around and I think I'm wasting my time. But if I actually pick a topic, then at least it's something to put my hands on. But um, this was good. Well, I, I, I'm glad you enjoyed it because I, I prefer these types of discussions. Like they're they're a lot easier, and we usually go into a lot more interesting stuff than if we have a topic set up. Yeah, and this is kind of plays into what we've been discussing here, kind of uh, the, the the natural ability to take what's in front of you and 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 grab hold of the moment and learn how to deal with it in real time rather than plan ahead of time for some perfect moment and a perfect conversation and a perfect girlfriend like this was a conversation that could have been couldn't have been planned or pre-generated this just kind of happened naturally and these kind of things is what happens on a date when you're in front of exactly. a girl exactly exactly 
And if you don't have the skills to be able to have these types of conversations, how do you think it's going to be when you go on a date? Because you don't have the list of the 10 things you're going to talk about. Yeah. Well, anyway, dude, have a good uh, evening and uh, we'll do it again soon. All right, man. Have a good one. All right. Say hi to Stephanie for me. I will. See you later. Bye. Take care.